Welcome to the 2021 Nautilus Book Awards Author Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Christine Upchurch. Now celebrating 21 years of honoring Better Books for a Better World, Nautilus Book Awards continues to embrace books from a wide spectrum in the publishing industry. Books which radiate hope and wisdom. Books which nurture our inner connection and connect us together as individuals, as communities, and as planetary citizens. This is a vast conversation, one which is particularly crucial now more than ever before. Today, we are honoring an award recipient who has won in two categories, Ginny Whitelaw. She's a Zen master. She's the founder of the Institute for Zen Leadership. For over a quarter century, she's combined deep science training with her senior leadership experience and mind-body practices to develop whole leaders in some of the world's top companies and also nonprofits. She holds degrees in physics, philosophy, and a doctorate in biophysics. She's formally in charge of integrating NASA's space station program. She's got a fifth degree black belt in Aikido, and she's authored four books, including The Zen Leader and her new award-winning book entitled Resonate, Zen and the Way of Making a Difference. She's won two awards. She's been honored as a gold winner in the Body, Mind, Spirit Practices. And she's also an award winner in the silver category, World Cultures, Transformational Growth and Development. I'd like to welcome Ginny Whitelaw. Congratulations, Ginny. Thank you so much, Christine. I love the fact that you've got this scientific background, and yet you've gone into what some people would refer to as sort of more esoteric uh, kind of realm of Zen. What prompted you to make that shift, and how do you combine the two? You know, it's funny how we find our way in life. Uh, it was in college when I started with a self-defense class. I was taking classes, some of which were at night, and women at my campus were being attacked. And so they had were offering self-defense classes. And I took one and I thought, this is really interesting. And it led to Aikido and a world-class Aikido teacher in graduate school who also trained in Zen. And he said to me, if you really want to reach the peak of your game in Aikido or in life, you need to start training in Zen. And I trusted my teacher, so I did that. I started meditating, and I understand now why he said that, because it really helps you see in the stillness what you miss in the flurry. And I would say it, it applies to leadership and life even more than in Aikido, that it helps us play our best game. Wow, uh, that, that, that's, that's a profound statement. I'm also fascinated by how you've combined the science with the more spiritual aspects of our beingness in your new book. Why did you call it Resonate? You know, the resonance is the thing that connects inner and outer. In our inner experience, how we feel, how you feel right now, and our outer impact in the world. And as a scientist, physics was my first science love. I, I worked in a high energy physics lab all through college. And you learn when you work in that field that energy is everywhere. <laughs> energy is everything. And under certain conditions, there's a resonance that stabilizes energy into a form we call matter. But even matter is a very fast vibrating form of energy, which is pretty much the idea of E equals MC squared. You know, we've known this since, since Einstein, since, you know, for more than a century of what a phenomenal energetic world we live in. And yet it doesn't work into our conventional way of looking at things quickly. We still think of energetic effects as being kind of woo woo or spiritual. I think what really drew me both as a practitioner of Eastern arts, which work to cultivate energy from inside out, and a lover of science, which works to study energy outside, you know, when we look at it objectively, putting those two worlds together made a world of sense to me. It 
it came through me. I mean, I guess you could say it resonated. It became a deep calling, a deep purpose for what I could see would come together and help people live most effectively and with the least amount of strain and worry and waste of energy. Mm, I, I love that. I love that because I think that so many people struggle just within their daily lives and you're offering a roadmap to um, kind of shift that, to be in resonance. So I know that you were a little resistant to writing this book, as you, as you talk about in this book. What prompted you to write this fourth book? You know, I was, I was doing a session at our training center, our dojo, and one of my colleagues, Gordon Green Roshi, was giving a talk, and it was a talk about climate action and climate change. And he was challenging us, saying, what makes this so hard? Why is it so hard to change our habits? How do we change how change happens? That was the question he posed to the group. And instantly, the physicist side of me starts going like, well, change always happens through resonance, always, because that's how energy changes form. So how do we change the conditions for resonance? And then it hit me that here we are in Zen training, in, in our line of Zen is a very physical line of Zen, very physical training. We're changing the resonance of this human instrument that you are, that I am. Like a bell or like a musical instrument, as we tune it and integrate it, it rings a, a clearer note in the world. So I was putting these together of changing the conditions of resonance and being in a line of training where that's exactly what our practices do. And I thought, maybe this is what I have to be writing about. And of course, as these ideas hit us, I mean, they resonate, right? I lit up with the idea and then all the doubt came in. Like, I'm kind of busy right now. I'm running an institute. There's a lot of other things I need to do. I know how much effort it takes to write a book. So all that internal resistance came up. And here's the key. When an idea won't let you go, and this one would not let me go, it's probably yours. And you may as well face into it. And part of what I have committed to in life is if it's my idea, or if it's an idea that hits me and won't let me go, if it's mine to mature or manifest, I will do it. And it's funny how life cooperates because not a week after, not a week after I made this decision, I got an email out of the nowhere <laughs> that is the zeitgeist asking me if I might have a book project that I would like to put on this platform called Publishizer, which is sort of a Kickstarter for books, but a way to run a pre-order campaign for a book to get interest in it. I'd never heard of this before, but I thought, well, here's a book on resonance. This would be a pretty good way to see if it's going to resonate. So I said yes, and off we went. Off we went with a, a, a campaign to to launch the book into the world. And that's that's how Resonate got started. Oh, I love that. I love that. So quick question for you. How does a person know if they're in resonance with something and something is in resonance with them? Because if it is all about that vibration, um, you've studied this for many years. You 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 got the the aha uh -huh. And that you you had this knowingness that it was time, and and the universe cooperated. What's what are some of the signs for a person to be in resonance with something? Well, you know, when we look at our own lives, we we find those signs and those signals all over because resonance again is at this interface between how we feel on the inside and how effective we are on the outside. So it feels good. So imagine dancing to the beat of a song. And when you just catch that beat, you know it. You know it because the energy builds. You don't feel out of step. Or if you sail, you know, you out and you know when you've got the boat trimmed just properly to match the wind and the waves because the sound is different. It's clearer. And the effect of the boat is, is better. Or when you're speaking to a group, you know when you're speaking right to their heart because of there's a sense of vibe or a sense of literally getting on the same wavelength, which we used to speak of almost metaphorically. And yet now we have measures where they can put EEG caps on people in communication to see it's more than a metaphor. We actually do get on the same wavelength. And when we have one of those deeply connected conversations with someone, we feel it. It, it registers inside. So part of 
part of the attunement that we can use as a practice to build our resonance is to pay attention to those signals when things feel like they're all coming together, when we kind of feel in flow or we feel like, oh, that was easy. There's a sense of ease that comes into being in resonance. So I tell people it's the easiest and hardest way to be. It's easiest because it feels so good and there's so little effort in the moment. But what makes it difficult is that to really tune ourselves to be so attuned takes practice. It takes practice. And that's where the practices of the book resonate take us to integrate, tune, and tame this instrument that we are so that it can be sensitive. It can sense the energies around us just like a great antenna. It can vibrate with them, meaning we start resonating and we turn that energy through our own physical bodies through our own creative mind into things that matter. Wow, that, that's so beautiful. Would you be willing to read a small section of your book to us? Thank you, I'd be glad to read from the book. And I'll read about a relationship, in fact, that started out not so much in resonance. I was frightened by Tanoi Roshi. I wanted so much for him to like me, to be impressed by me, and instead, he would slice and dice me up into little pieces, reduce me to tears, make me feel like a total failure. In other words, he was an outstanding teacher. But his frequent irritation with me was also genuine. I remember one morning in particular when the vibe between us was very bad. He was angry at me for something. I don't recall the specifics, but I do recall that I was certain I was right and he had misunderstood the whole situation. I was meditating in the dojo. He was in the adjoining kitchen, but even at a distance, I could feel his anger. While the little voice in my head kept repeating its side of the story again and again. At some point it quieted and an expansive state opened up. I could suddenly feel the whole picture. What it felt like to be Tanoi when the disruption named Ginny blew into town. I could feel what a clumsy pain in the ass I had been. Filled with clarity and remorse after the meditation session ended, I marched into the kitchen and poured out my heartfelt apology to Tanoi. He nodded, offered me a cup of tea. Our relationship strengthened from that day onward. Since that pivotal morning, I've had the experience countless times of seeing how changes in me shift the relationships I'm engaged in. If the relationship has been stuck or troubled, when I free up, it frees up. If the relationship has been skating the surface of an issue, when I deepen my listening, it deepens. I bet you could find similar examples in your own life and I draw your attention to them because it is through the relationships of our life that our application of resonance is most direct, up close and personal. We don't change other people except through resonance, which means we change ourselves first. Applying resonance to the relationships of our life is powerful and wide ranging. In a sense, life is nothing but a stream of relationships between you and the world from people to situations, each with an energetic quality affected by how you engage them. We have particular power to apply resonance in human relationships because we are well human, because all things vibrate and change according to their nature. We are better able to send and receive resonance signals with another human than we are to move a mountain or communicate with a moth. Some people are closer to Lardass Largo while others are Springy Allegro, but we all live, breathe, walk, talk, and chew gum in a recognizable range of human frequencies. That means we can use ourselves as sensitive receivers and powerful transmitters to meet others where they are and to get them moving with us and us with them. What a, a beautiful, beautiful story. And uh, you're such a wonderful writer too. One of the things that came up for me, and I, I've got chills as you were reading, Ginny. I'm wondering, what does vulnerability have to do with tuning into and being in resonance? Mm. It's a great question, Christine, because when we are open systems, we're taking energy in. So in that sense, making ourselves vulnerable, we're picking up, we're attuned. 
And it means that we we acknowledge we we will have to deal with whatever that resonates in us. It may hit our triggers. It may make us feel this way or that. When we try to protect ourselves and be invulnerable, we can only put those shields up by maintaining a quality of tension, which makes us less sentient, in a sense, less alive. And the more we do that, the more we drain our energy into holding up our shields and into resisting the energy around us rather than going with it. So your question is right on that there is a sense in which we have to acknowledge vulnerability to be the open flowing system. And we, that's part of our practice is to develop the foundational strength, strength that we really build through deep breathing in the lower abdomen, the area we call hara, the key center in the, in the martial arts, the center of power, so that we feel strong enough to be vulnerable. Mm. Yes, that makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. Now, in your subtitle, you talk about making a difference. Now, I know that there are, are people out there who have this deep inner yearning to make a difference. Whether they're actually recognizing it or not, they might be busy suppressing it, they might be busy avoiding it um, because of their busyness, because of the chaos of life. Does this add another layer to, to get exhausted by if we are, are working towards making a difference in the world? Yeah, we can get so caught up in busyness, in that long to-do list, in all the commitments we made in the yesterdays of our life that still require attention today. I know it. I, I live that way, too, and it's something I have to pay a good deal of attention to. When And when if it is draining our energy and we don't have energy to be able to focus on the things that really matter the truly pivotal work the work that we might say is in our zone of genius or is purposeful for us is on purpose then we can kind of fritter away our day fritter away our time and it doesn't feel as deeply fulfilling like we're really living into what we came here to do or making our greatest difference conversely when we attune ourselves and listen to life and let it change us, we can better set our priorities so that we don't exhaust ourselves. When we're not holding up those shields, we don't get so tired. When we're able to plug in and be a part of, not apart from the energy around us, we're running more plugged in rather than on battery power. When we're able to take energy in and not fight with it or get all triggered, we don't exhaust ourselves in stress. So there's ways we can be in ourself with our own instrument that let us do the most important and meaningful work of our life inexhaustibly. So rather than layering another thing to do on top of a busy life already, Resonate helps us discern what truly is ours to do, clear out some of the ground clutter, and be able to focus where it makes the greatest difference in a way that we keep renewing ourselves. It is regenerative. So it gives us a chance to live our, I say, most significant life in a way that is not exhausting, but is self-recharging. You know, I think about what's been going on the last year or so, maybe for many years, and I, and I think about how so many people are in fear. You can see it through the divisiveness. You can see it through people's reactions to, you know, what's going on in the world, whether it be relating to health or politics. Um, what effect does fear have on our residents and uh, how do we mitigate it in a healthy way? Yes. You're so wise in pointing out how fear is at the foundation of the great divides we're struggling with in society and in our world. And fear acts to create a sense of separation. I'm separate from you. I'm separate from that person over there. And then greed can kick in or self-survival can kick in. Like I have to look out for number one and maybe don't make a lot of time or room for number two or anyone else. Part of where Zen training takes us, and this is why the practice becomes so helpful, is it gives us an experience of our connectedness 
And I don't mean connected like boxcars are connected on a train. I mean interpenetration without obstruction kind of connectedness, interpenetrating energetic fields, which we truly are. If you and I are on a Zoom screen right now, but if we're in a room together, we'd see how much our energy is actually integrating with each other. We could measure it with magnetometers and see how our fields are actually affecting each other. Even on a Zoom screen, it is striking to me how much energy transfers. When we feel and experience this connectedness, the separation doesn't, have, doesn't give fear room to grow. So part of how we take fear out of the world is to help people experience that interconnectedness. That's why there is a Zen in the way of making a difference. It helps people have that experience. So it's not even just a belief. It is as real as any other thing you do in your day. You sense how you are connected to other people, to the planet, to life itself. And from that place, we make wiser decisions. We don't get caught up in our own fears of separation. Because when you look in your own life, whenever you feel afraid, you feel alone. So you cure the aloneness or the separation and the fear falls away. That's what we need to do in our society is help that connectedness, that love come through so that the fear can fall away. Every human being is prone to fear and greed and self-survival and all those things. That's part of how we're put together. And that's not our total human story. Every human being is capable of sensing connection and love and being a part of a more heavenly state. And on that inspirational note, we're gonna wrap this up. Jenny Whitelaw, uh, you're, an, a, you're a wonderful author and a fabulous teacher. I wanna learn more and I'm, I'm sure our viewers want to learn more as well. Um, I wanna thank you for doing what you do and for writing this fourth book that, that you were somewhat resistant to writing and, and eventually allowed it to flow. Great wisdom coming through it. Um, and again, it's, it's a, a gold and silver award-winning um, book and it's called Resonate. Zen and the Way of Making a Difference. I'd like to thank you, thank you, Ginny, and I would like to thank the Nautilus Book Awards for spotlighting uh, your wonderful book. As I would thank them as well, and thank you, Christine.